Well, we are right at seven o'clock. And as I said, I'd like to get started right away. Mm -hmm. So I will uh, give a little introduction and we'll start our presentation because I know you have a full presentation. So uh, I don't want to rush you at all. So um, in the meantime here, while I'm doing my little introductions, um, please, everyone, you can use that chat to, to say hello. Um, and if you have any questions, please do use that chat and uh, let us know if there's any um, technical issues or anything that's going on that we might not be aware of. I'm going to be facilitating this this evening, so I'll, I'll do my best to solve any issues. So um, I'd like to thank everyone for attending tonight's webinar. Um, this is Mohonk Preserve's continuing webinar series on fungi. Um, and this evening's topic is uh, spring mushrooms. Um, so spring has definitely sprung in the last few weeks here. So we're all excited for... Um, for spring mushrooms and everything else spring. So my name is Lauren Bohr. Um, I'm the education coordinator for the public programs and youth programs here at Mohawk Preserve. Um, and I'm, like I said, I'm gonna be monitoring um, this presentation this evening, facilitating it. So I will handle uh, any questions, anything like that that might be going. Um, so before I introduce our um, presenter, Bill, um, just a few reminders. Um, again, if you have questions, you can use the chat box. Um, there'll be time at the at the end of the presentation um, that if you are a slow typer it doesn't that's not what you're comfortable with you'll probably notice that there's a little hand on the right hand side that says speak you can click on that and I can admit you into the room and you can just ask your question verbally if, if typing is not your deal. So we can always do that. Um, this is going to be recorded. So if for some reason you have to buzz out early, uh, that's okay. Um, it will be recorded. I will send the recording out. It will be available on our website as well. Um, so now I'm going to introduce Bill. Um, so tonight's presenter is Bill Bakaitis. He's taught at Dutchess Community College for 38 years before he retired in 2006. And then during his teaching career, he was granted sabbaticals to study graduate level mycology um, at SUNY New Paltz and the New York State Museum in Albany, where I got to work with John Haynes, the New York State mycologist. Um, he's a popular speaker. We were just uh, talking about his time uh, this Today, was it today or earlier uh, or yesterday, um, speaking at the Culinary Institute. So he does a lot of speaking engagements. Um, so he's given educational programs in mycology um, at the Institute of Eco Studies, Ecosystem Study in Millbrook, again, the Culinary Institute of America and Hudsonia at Bard College, as well as many other institutions throughout the Northeast. In 1983, he founded the Mid-Hudson Mycological Association and since 1984 has worked with poison control networks throughout the Northeast. Um, his articles have been published in the New York State Conservationist, Adirondack Life, Mid Hudson Magazine, the Poughkeepsie Journal, uh, Mushroom, the Journal of Wild Mushroomering, Mushroomering, I can't even say that word right tonight, um, where you're a contributing editor. And there's lots of other places too that you can find Bill. So um, without further ado, I'm gonna turn things over to Bill per Bill Bakaitis is going to be presenting on spring mushrooms. And would you like me to um, bring your slide presentation up right now for you? Yeah, I think so. Okay. Yeah. Bring it right up. Yep. All right. There we go. Right. There we go. I don't have to worry about the light shining through behind me there. <laughs> You're right. It just got lighter and all, and that's, that light is there. So uh, welcome everybody. Uh, I'm glad uh, to to have you here. I can't see you. I only see my screen, which is not so nice. But there we go. Um, but I will see a group of you on uh, Friday when we go out for a walk. Uh, and uh, Lauren has sent out instructions on that where that is. So I want to go through a number of things today, and I and and. We, we, we want to go through them in a slow, um, well, not, not really plotting some way, but, but in a, a slow, logical way to do that. I think the next here is what we go. There we go. Some of you, those of you who took the, uh, the course about uh, winter mushrooms uh, will recognize this was my last slide. And uh, those of you who, uh, most of you, maybe all of you know that that's a morel. In particular, a black morel. And we'll look at those and some of the differences coming up. Um, there are <clears throat> essentially two parts of this talk. The first one is brief. And I want to talk about 
some technical aspects about fungi and uh, their place in, in the life sciences. Uh, not that you need to know this, not that there's going to be any test on it or anything of that sort, but just you should know uh, something about, I think you should know something about the, um, the, the science uh, behind uh, fungi. They're quite different than other life forms, as, as we'll come to see. And then the, the large part of this will be common spring species. And I will emphasize uh, edible ones. I know most people are interested in that. So I'll end, emphasize, emphasize edible ones and uh, some of their poison uh, lookalikes. And you'll see why I want to do this, this first part as we do that. So uh, on this slide, the only thing you really need to sort of draw our attention, we draw our attention to, oh my gosh, sorry, oh, sorry, sorry, oh boy, so, I'm really torn that's a fellow who's in the hospital dying, but I assume he'll wait for <laughs> Wait for another hour and a half. Okay, so of the five, the, in the place in the in the uh, in the animal kingdom here, the, the the life sciences is that fungi are neither animals nor plants, and that's 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 the important distinction that that, that I want to make here. They have their own life cycle, they have their own sexuality, um, and they are members of the the high the higher kingdoms. Uh, this is over here on this side. I don't know if my face is there. I don't know how to move my face out of there, but. On my sky, slide, my face is there, but but this is the, a tree of life, sort of Darwin's tree of life. Uh, everything uh, evolves from uh, uh, previous uh, mother mothers. We're daughter cells until we get sex, and then we're the the the, the offspring of our mother and father. Uh, I don't think there are any fungi in this tree of life. But what one of the things we can't talk about is we've used this tree of life now. This this. Uh, Darwinian evolution. When we do a lot of uh, trying to identify fungi, so one of the ways we do that, we use uh, barcodes and uh, the, the, we look at the DNA to see where the DNA came from. And all of that's involved what we call vertical transmission of DNA. It goes from, from uh, parents to child, and then the child becomes a parent and, and, and it goes from mother to daughter. Uh, and, and, and that's, that's the general uh, take on things. And by using uh, DNA work, we can, we can figure out uh, who, our, who the parents were and uh, where we fit in this, this kingdom. Uh, moving on just a bit, and again, you don't need to know much about this, just, just to understand that, that fungi are very complex. And this starts to illustrate some of the complexity here. Uh, if you don't look at the DNA, but you look at genetic subunits, and a number of people do that, then you end up with a totally different picture of how it is that life has evolved. Uh, not only do, do, do small subunits of uh, genetic material transfer back and forth within the, between the kingdoms, uh, and we, they, they, they are contained within our, the, our very body. We have cells in our very body which came from other organisms, not of our mother and father, but and most of them are in the, in the distant evolutionary past, but some of them uh, can be uh, of this generation. And that's called horizontal gene transfer. And some of you know this, some of you don't. You can look it up online. Uh, horizontal gene transfer, sometimes you, you talk about jumping genes, maybe you've heard that, or transposons, or plasmid exchange. But what we know is that living organisms can send genetic material from one to the other, and they do it through little snippets. Right? And, and, and by and large, that's how we, we wanted, that technology enabled us to understand uh, how to make a, uh, a vaccine uh, in five months. You know, that, that we, we couldn't have done that. We were relying strictly on DNA at work. If you want to read about this, The Tangled Tree by David Quammen is a great source. Uh, my favorite character in that is Barbara McClintock. Uh, she was finding out horizontal gene transfer in the 19, late 40s and early 1950s. And, uh, and she said, you know, there's something going on in corn, ZMAs, corn, that didn't come from their ancestors. And no one believed her. I mean, first of all, it, 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 uh, it conflicted with the central dogma 
of Crick and Watson, which later came Crick and Watson. It just violated the central idea. And the other thing is she was a woman. And I think that's, I think that's those two things, probably as much the second thing as anything. So she was ignored, ignored, ignored until 1983 when she won the Nobel Prize for her, her, her findings there. So this diagram um, you know, around the year 2000. Uh, so the Tangled Tree and also Entangled Lives, two very good uh, sources to look at if you're interested. Uh, when we look at the five kingdoms and we think about fungi, uh, technically we're, we're talking about uh, sac fungi or ascomycetes. Their uh, spores are, are protected in a, in a sausage-shaped structure called an aci. And basidiomycetes, they, there's, their, their spores are naked on the ends of clubs. So they're basidiomycetes and ascomycetes. And traditionally, uh, slime molds, myxomycetes, were considered a fungus. Now they're in their own kingdom. And I will talk about those, uh, talk about the biology a, a bit, and then sh we'll look at a few examples. And then we'll move on to ascos and basidios. <clears throat> those of you who, who have been around from the beginning will know from the first course that I gave here, uh, this is a diagram from that course. Uh, Lauren and I were talking about this uh, as, as we were assembling. I checked the other day, this talk, has been downloaded 26,000 times. So apparently there's something in there worth, worth looking at. Uh, this, this, this is a typical basidiomycete life cycle. And here's how it goes. In the mushroom with gills or, or tubes or teeth, uh, spores are released when they're mature. And they're released and they fall to the ground. And they're, they're not like a seed. They don't have a little plant in them like a seed does, but they just germinate and turn into a, a hair. And it's called a hypha, uh, hypha. So it just, just grow, grows into this long hair. And if that long strand happens to meet a compatible strand, then they fuse. And this is called plasmogamy. And that's the beginning of the sex act in fungi. So from that point on, the, the, the two cells here have fused. And they make a common cell, but the but the nuclei in Greek with the the carrion, the nuts don't join. So this this dikaryotic mycelium uh, just grows and grows and grows until someplace along the line it decides to turn into a mushroom, and then in the um, uh, hymenium there's a, a brief point of about three cell divisions when the nuclei get together, and that's called karyogamy. So you have plasmogamy here, and then dikaryotic mycelium, and then karyogamy. And then immediately it splits up again, and you have the single diploid state. So, um, so that's, that's uh, the, the typical cycle here. I, I'm sorry, that's Jim, the message will pick that up. Um, now, here's the important thing. Since, since the, this, uh, the, the, the fact that you have a, a, two, a mating between a plus and a minus strain, we don't call that male and female, but a plus and minus strain, the fact that they join there does not preclude a third, a fourth, or a millionth from joining in. So that becomes really important when you try to understand what fungi are, how, how do you identify them, and what kind of powers they have. Because fungi have an enormous genetic library from which they draw material, gen genetic information. They draw um, the DNA provides uh, messenger RNA, which then uh, creates protein, which will then break down the substrate in which they live. The other thing about mushrooms, not only that they have a dikaryotic mycelium, but they digest their food outside the body. So what happens here then is that the, the, this incredible genetic library produces uh, chemicals which go out and digest the substrate, largely carbonaceous material, cellulose and those sorts of things, that, 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 that they then can digest. So that's, that's important to look at this, this, this in, in, in context. Uh, more in program one of this series if you want more of that. Now, <clears throat> The fungi that have uh, their spores protected, and we'll have a look at the spores in the next slide, they're protected in a sac. They, they have that traditional uh, uh, dikaryotic mycelium right here. Let's consider this a morel. 
the mineral spores land on the ground and they 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 form this long uh, these long strands. They have plasmogamy. Somewhere along the line, they have karyogamy, and that can occur anywhere in the cycle. And they form a fruiting body, and that's the morale. So they have the same structure the basidium mycetes do, but they have another structure as well. The single nucleus, the what would you call that? The haploid uh, uh, spore uh, does not have to join with another in order to complete a cycle and form a morale, form a fruiting body. So you have a couple of kinds of morels in this in this cycle here. The other thing is that there's also what's called this is a, these are sexual cycles and there's another cycle called an asexual cycle, and in that case there's a mold which is genetically identical to the morels, and it lives lives and it it cycles through the environment in an asexual way, and it just buds and, and the, the mother cell makes daughter cells and. Uh, it, it, it doesn't join into a mycelium, and then it goes through in this way, and uh, well, there is a mycelium, but it's of a different sort. So morels can have new genetic input put in on, a, on an annual basis. So these are quite complex, and we'll, we'll see how that, that ties into mushroom identification and uh, mistakes that you and I might make just in, in a slide or two. And moving on to the slime molds just briefly here, <clears throat> Uh, slime molds are different and they only have one cell. The whole slime mold is just one cell, but inside there may be millions of nuclei. So again, it's, uh, it's quite different than uh, cells in our body where you, you, you've got a set of chromosomes and uh, one nuclei has a set of chromosomes in it. So here, and, and, and the other thing about a slime mold is that they, well, they're slimy. Okay, uh, and they their 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 life cycle is half of the time they live like an amoeba, like a little animal, and they just move through the substrate. They will move through the log or the soil or the pine needles on the ground, and they just crawl along. And you can actually watch that with a ten power hand lens. You can see them move and see them quite easily with a with a field with a dissecting microscope at a hundred power, and really see it at a thousand power. You just see it it's pulsing and streaming in there. So it, it lives part of its life like an amoeba. And then when conditions are, are, are right for it, it forms a mushroom-like structure and makes spores. And that's the slime molds. But because they digest internally and they're unicellular, they've been taken out of fungi. They have their own kingdom now. So you don't need to know any more about that, except that it, things are very complex when you come to fungi. They're not a plant. They're not an animal. They have their own lifestyle. So this is what the sausage shaped structure looks like. That's an ascus, okay? Uh, it's an asci and plural. It's an uh, plural is an asci, so it's, a, it's an ascus. And this is a basidium right over here, okay? And it's a club. So you can see how the spores are here. Tip typically four here and typically eight here, although not always. And in a slime mold, the spores are just formed here and there uh, on in the organism. Okay. So what that means then for us is that it's really difficult to identify mushrooms. Uh, and, there, and there are three ways essentially of doing this. And, and those of you who've been around for all the talks will know I, I spent a good deal of time in this in the talk on chanterelles. So there's a, a good deal of, of, of discussion about it there. But three different ways to, do, to identify mushrooms. One is by morphology, uh, field identification. And just looking at fungi, you know, what do they look like? You know, do they have gills like this one does? Do they, are they cup-shaped like this one? Uh, do, are, are, what color are the gills? Uh, what, what the cap look like? What colors are down here? What kind of, so just things you can look at and see. Um, if you add chemicals, then you have a different, uh, more characters to dif differentiate. And look through a microscope, you have more. But that's all morphology. It's quite different from, from other methods. For example, you could use mating. In mating, we may have some ideas, some man, some human ideas about what fungi are, but they don't have to particularly agree with those. You know, they, they have their own lives to live. And very often we find things that we say, are oh, there two different mushrooms? They don't think so, and they mate. 
Well, from this point of view, if they mate and they have viable offspring, they're the same species. So that's a different way of identifying mushrooms. And then third, you can use DNA barcoding. And I know a lot of people are doing this now uh, using polymerized chain reaction to take a bit of material and bulk it up, then subject that material uh, to different enzymes, which are created by, by uh, bacteria, which cleave, as they say, cut the, cut the, the molecular material apart at different places. And there are different enzymes that do this in different ways. And depending upon the enzymes used, you'll get different barcodes. And some of those barcodes are helpful in differentiating between different species of mushrooms. So, so all these, these three don't necessarily uh, agree. And most, and many times they disagree. Uh, it's, it's wonderful to have all three of them agree, but that's not, that's, I, I can't say how many they do and how many they don't, but just the general thing is there are lots of problems here. There are some specific difficulties we have. <clears throat> we call some of these species cryptic species. That means they have the same morphology. They look ex almost exactly the same, but they have different DNA. And because they have different DNA, they can have different effects in the environment. And if that environment happens to be your body, they can have different effects in your gut, in your nervous system. And some of the, you can eat a mushroom which looks like it's an edible mushroom, but it's not. And we'll see examples of that. The other thing is we, we will have what are called not only cryptic species, but sister species. And sister species, uh, they, they look different, but they have the same DNA. I've already hinted at that when I talked about morels. There's a mold, which is a morel. And then there's a morel, which is a morel. But they're this, uh, genetically identical. So those are sister species. And you see the same thing when you go by white button mushrooms or cremini or portobello. All those are the same, uh, Agaricus bisporus, one of the strains, uh, Agaricus bisporus, but, but the, this, the environmental differences make them look differently. And then finally, you have hybrids, where, and hybrids exist in nature, where they, they, they go back and forth in nature. And we, we think of those as uh, two different barcodes in the same specimen, that they're transitional from one to the other. And I have collected uh, fungi, sent them off to herbaria, uh, where they've looked at them and said, this is a transitional species, and we don't. It's it, it's moving from one species to another. So what that means is there's lots of different uh, uh, ways that we're going to be able to identify mushrooms, and uh, those of us who go out and collect mushrooms to eat uh, should be aware of these things because we can make mistakes that uh, that get us into difficulty. So on to spring. This is a slime mold. And you see it's just crawled out of like the slug, not too much different from a slug actually. It's climbed out of the, uh, the its substrate and it's made this structure. And this is all one cell, one cell structure. It looks though it might have broken apart down here and that's another one and that's another one. That's how they divide. You just you break them apart and they, they keep keep multiplying. But but what they've done is just the slime has just crawled out of the grasses here and made this this structure. And you see the slug is eating it. Okay, here is uh, you see it better. You see the streaming plasmodium coming up. Okay, and it's make, and, and it, it encompasses this whole area here, and this then becomes a single-celled organism containing millions of nuclei. This happens to be Physerum poly polycephalum, and here's a better shot of that, or another shot of it. And uh, you can see again, the, the organism has come out of the log here and it's streaming towards, uh, towards fruition and it fruits and this is what it looks like. Many heads, polycephalum. Uh, the interesting thing about slime molds, one of the things, a lot of interesting things, is that it, it, you can only tell them when they become mature. Before that, they all look the same. This, for example, this is the plasmodium streaming towards uh, another species called Leocarpus fragilis. And the only way you can tell the difference, well, I guess you could genetically, uh, and you might be able to tell it by mating, but by, by looking at them, you have to wait until they mature. Okay? And so here is Leocarpus fragilis. You see it look quite different than, uh, than um, polycephalum. Here's uh, Fulgoseptica. 
Okay, and here's the plasmodium uh, of Fuligo septica. Okay, and you can see it looks the same at this stage, but it looks different at this stage. And here is Fuligo septica, uh, sort of an isolated case. You see here the slime coming out of the earth, and it's forming this athelia, we call it, or bun shaped structure. The spores are inside. Now, we come to the first edible of the evening. This is an edible mushroom, and it is eaten in the tropics. Now, you might say, why would, I've never eaten it, I never would, but, but that's, that's just me. But some people eat this. You might say, well, why would they eat it? I have been to the island of St. Lucia and to Eleuthera, and it is all over the place there. Now, these are nutrient-poor soils. You know, tropical soils are really poor, often poor so soils. St. Lucia is a volcanic island, so the soils there are quite poor, uh, and, and they have to struggle often to make gardens grow. But this thing just covers on, underneath the, the, the pine trees down there. So you can all, it's almost like manna from heaven, you know, and you, you could get bushels of it um, from just walking, uh, walking along paths. So it is an edible species down there. And they call it caca de luna. And you know what that means, right? Caca de luna. It's a, a filio septica is also called dog vomit. And you, you can see why. Uh, it actually looks a little better here when you see the spores mature. And there it is. Uh, so pull up a dinner plate, folks, and let's go at it. Right? Okay. Here's another slime mold, uh, Lycogla epidendrum, a wolf's milk, Lycogla, mil wolf's milk, uh, and uh, sometimes it's called toothpaste slime. This is the little bun-shaped structures that it's made. And as the spores mature, they mature inside that and they look like this. So here you crush this and it looks like uh, Pepsi and toothpaste. You crush this, you get these powdery black spores out. There are about 450, 500 slime molds. Uh, people collect them and keep them in matchboxes and they play with them uh, in the wintertime when you don't have anything else to do. We'll come and look at uh, morels a little later and we'll talk about some ascomycetes right now. But um, uh, we'll come and talk about that a little later. And just to remind you that there is a, a separate program on morels that you can find in the, the, um, the archives of, that we've had. So we will also a little later talk about the false morel, uh, the uh, possibly deadly uh, gyromitra. Uh, there, there are a number of these. We'll, we'll, we'll pick that up a little later. Okay, uh, in the meantime, uh, we'll, we'll, we'll just look at some other discomycetes or some ascomycetes. If you remember a few slides ago, we had that uh, brilliant orange or uh, orange cup. Um, Sarcocypha uh, is the genus of that one. It might be nicely brightly colored and some other, some other pizzizes like that are brightly colored. But here is that they, they often look, they're sort of dull and tan. They look like this cup. The, this, this, the spores are in sacs inside of this. And actually, that, that one that I photographed that uh, Lauren put up uh, from, for us just today, uh, when I photographed it, I touched it and poof, from right here, it just it just sprayed out. Uh, you can hear it. It sounds like a, a hissing sound, and all the spores are discharged at the same time. It's qu quite neat to see that. But that's that's typical of these. And there, there are hundreds of them. Um, often very difficult to identify. This is uh, another Pazizza rapanda like the last one, but this has just uh, gotten bigger. And they, you know, they're a discomycete. Think of it a little bit like a disc, like a Frisbee. Uh, this is, this right here, these spots are penicillium, lots of varieties of penicillium. Uh, and uh, so th they've taken up residence on this line, on this discomycete right here. So here's uh, Pazizza batio confusa, which is another cup fungus, uh, and lots of lots of them that uh, that are very confusing. Uh, this is one which is of primary uh, economic importance in the area around here. This is the cedar apple gull. Uh, it's called Gymnosporangia juniperi, uh, and it grows uh, on juniper, on eastern red cedar, uh, and it looks like an apple. See, it's a hard shape, looks like an apple. Uh, when it transfers to another species, and this will, it'll transfer now to an apple tree, and it'll look like the, the cedar. So this is called a heteroecious fungus. That means that it has two hosts. So on this plant, it looks like this. 
And the next warm rain we get, this is what's going to happen. These long arms are going to come out and they're going to release their spores. And the spores will then go and infect the apple blossom and the tender apple leaves. And you will get apple scab on the apples. So we, so that's why apples, the orchard, one of the, one of the diseases that the orchards are sprayed rigorously around here. And it's almost impossible to get rid of these. You have to cut down all of the, the cedar, uh, eastern red cedar, and it's kind of difficult to do that. So it's a, so again, that's a case where you have two very different looking organisms. This one, well, we're not going to see the one that looks like, like uh, apple scab, but, but it's the same, absolutely same genetics, and they just skip skip how they look every generation. Now, moving on to uh, some of the basidiomycetes. Uh, let's start with this one, which is very common in the spring. Uh, you all, I'm sure you're going to see this. This is a common weed fungus of the spring. It's called polyporous squamosis. Polyporous, many spores, many pores. And the pores are, are rather than, than gills, they have little pores in which the spores mature on, under side of the, uh, the, the the mushroom here. So this is sometimes called dryad saddle or tractor seats. Uh, I'll show you why tractor seats in just a moment. Now, uh, names in fungi change quite a bit. Often it just depends upon who's doing the work and what they want to call it. So in nine, around 1945, a group of uh, mycologists put all the polypores together you know, uh, uh, probably before that, but the, the, all of these used to be uh, agarics at one time, but then, you know, they, things keep changing. Now they're polypores. Uh, but because of genetics and other things, they decided to break them up. So this is now often called now seriopores, C-E-R-I-O, porous. Uh, and that's a name taken from a public, a French publication in 1847, I think. Uh, so the, the current names are all published in Funga, um, Index Fungorum. You can find it online. Uh, I would advise you to learn at least one of the Latin names. This one has 40 different Latin names. Okay. I think Polyporus squamosus is probably the most common. You could call it, uh, you know, a dryad saddle or a tractor seat. But it's not going to get you very far when you want to go and learn something deeper about it. Is it? edible, is it poisonous? But if you get to learn at least one Latin name, then you can go to Index, Index Fungorum and find out what name it is. And you can, you can research, re research it online in different textbooks to, uh, to, to find if it's edible or not, for example, if you want to eat it. And this one is edible. And I know many collectors who prefer this to morels. I know it sounds crazy, but they prefer to eat this rather than morels, okay? They, they like it at this stage, it will be tough, and they'll cut it, slice it very thin, uh, and, uh, and you, in, in saute it or in, in that way, okay? This is what it looks like when it gets older. Seriporous squamosis or polyporous squamosis or polyporous, 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 okay? So this is what it looks like. It's still edible at this stage. Most people who collect it collect only the outer rim of it. Uh, and by, by the time they get this big, they start to get pretty rank, uh, have a sort of a rank nasal quality. Uh, and it's a little bit like watermelon rind. And some people like that and they pickle it and things of that sort. Uh, but, um, but there you go. You can see how much moisture a mush these mushrooms uh, process. I mean, they're pulling all the moisture and other things out of the tree. They're growing on trees that have been dead for about four years, and they're and that's when they start to fruit. And they these 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 are fruits. And as they start feeding the, the mycelium, mycelium inside the tree, feeds the fruit. It passes lots of water there, so you get they're very moist, and they 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 can get um, they have to be tough because uh, bacteria want to decay them, things like that. So so the flavor and texture change. There are a number of other little shelf mushrooms like this, which look like that. Uh, this is Favilus alveolaris. Uh, a new name for that is called Neofavilus. That's easy to figure out, right? Neo, new Favilus. Uh, uh, and and the and genetics uh, data allowed them or maybe required them 
to uh, change uh, the, the name. So this is all sometimes called the hexagonal poured polypore. Um, that's what Gary Linkoff calls it. I guess I, I'll mention something now about the, the textbooks, the, the field guides that I've recommended. Linkoff field guide is by far, far and above the best uh, for the Northeast, all around field guide for the Northeast, particularly for uh, beginners. It's very user friendly. It has some problems. Uh, it's gone through 30 editions or so without changing the name. So a lot of the names are older. We found out more information about them since 1980. 1980 when it was published, uh, and and you have to go to the back of the book to find the, the 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 descriptions along with the technical names. But the photographs are arranged cheek by jowl to have things that look look alike. There, you can often identify what you have in your hand just by flipping through that book. And then when you when you get when you see something that looks like it, then you go to the the pages where it's described. And you can you can key in on on it in more detail. Of the other two books that I that I uh, recommended, there's a small one, which is an easy, easy guide. Uh, I have it right here. You can't see my tiny thumbnail. Maybe you can. I don't know. This is the, the Audubon guide here. Uh, it has that maroon cover. It really is alongside my head. You can see it's really a pocket size. You can put it in your pocket. Uh, and this is the, uh, the Mushrooms of the Northeast, a simple guide, Mushrooms of the Northeast. I don't know if you can see that or not there. Uh, but if I put it alongside my head, you can see you could probably put that in your backpack too, right? Uh, it doesn't, it's not very, if you're going to just have a, have a casual uh, acquaintance with fungus, that may be, that may be all you need. If you're going to get a little more involved, you're going to get a lot of books. And maybe the next one to get would be this one. This is Timberoni's Mushrooms of Northeastern United States and Canada. And if I put this next to my head, you see that you're not going to easily put that in your pocket, nor in your field guide. Uh, so I would recommend uh, the Audubon guide. The problem is right now it's tied up in that supply chain stuff. And it's I can't get any clear answer about when or even if it's going to. And everyone says, yes, it will be, be reprinted. Actually, there's one publisher which apparently had a air shipment in. Because for a brief period of time, it was available there. You can go to eBay. I saw it on eBay for $540. Uh, you can do better than that. Okay, so there are a lot of, back to these, back to these. Now, this is edible. Uh, this is in the Linkoff's book. It is an edible mushroom. You have to get it when it's tender. It's mostly on hickory, sometimes poplar, early in the spring. It's an early spring mushroom. I think this was also the one that was uh, uh, on the general introduction. Uh, advertisement of the course, the, the website. Uh, so here's another one, which I'm sure most of you know, and you'll probably call it a chicken mushroom. I would, I would please learn a, a name besides chicken mushroom. Maybe, maybe sulfur shelf. It's a little more descriptive uh, than chicken mushroom. There are so many mushrooms that are called chicken mushrooms that uh, it's going to be hard if, if you try to identify it as that. You, you, you may not be able to, to get very far. And people have different ideas about what a chicken mushroom is. Uh, but this one is choice, not only edible, but it is choice uh, with caution. And the caution is that you should only eat it on certain trees. I Just this afternoon, I found one starting out back in my house. Uh, very small size of a of a large plum, small orange, and very soft, um, and it will grow um, through these different stages and, and become uh, the sulfur shelf mushroom. The shelf means that it has one layer on top of another, on top of another, on top of another. Uh, this is a polypore, so if you call it polyporous sulfurous, you're way ahead, and if you call it a chicken mushroom. Okay. Now, the sulfur shelf, polyporous uh, sulfurous, uh, have been around for a long time as names. Chicken mushroom has two, I guess. Uh, and the interesting thing is some people eat it and they do fine. Some people eat it and they get sick. Now, why? Could be that you've got an individual reaction to the mushroom, an idiosyncratic reaction that you are allergic to a particular mushroom, just like some people are allergic to milk. Okay? 
there are certain foods that uh, certain bodies just cannot tolerate, and maybe that's the case. Or maybe you collected it from a tree that was not oak or red cherry. So sulfurious grows on oak and red cherry, and collected from those trees, it is generally edible for most people. I'll come back to that in a moment. But it's not edible to all people. Uh, and if it's, and certainly if it's growing on another tree, let's say it's growing on a pine or a hemlock, mm, no, sir, don't do that. Because this probably is the one which is pretty toxic. That's, uh, we used to be polyparous uh, huronensis, but we now, uh, but, so it is huronensis. So, uh, so, and that one is, is, can make you quite sick. Um, almost anybody quite sick if it's growing on hemlock. Uh, so, a couple of things here. The new name for this is Laetoporus or Laetiporus, some people say. Laetoporus, okay. So, uh, sulfurious, the genus has been changed. The reason they changed the genus here is they wanted polyporous only to have white rot fungus in them. And those of you who've taken one of our other earlier courses will know the difference between white and brown rot fungus. This is a brown rot fungus. So they took it out of polyporous, created their own uh, uh, a genus, Latiparous. But in that case, they kept the, the specific name, sulfurious. There's Latiparous sulfurious and Latiparous huronensis. So there are about seven different species uh, in, in North America, uh, which look alike, but they have different genetic composition and and they can make you sick okay now some of them are guaranteed almost guaranteed to make you sick the other ones it looks as though polyparous sulfurious uh the people that it tends to make sick um, more women than men get sick from eating this and particularly if alcohol is involved I don't not know why some people thought it was a sex linked condition i, I don't know uh, but some people think it's an alcohol link condition, and I don't know. But uh, we do know from re anecdotal reports that it's more likely to you get sick if you are um, a woman or you use alcohol with this. Now, let's say you let's say you bought your mushrooms from a from a farm stand, or from some guy who brings some mushrooms into you and says, "Here's some chicken mushrooms. You want to buy them?" You say, "Yeah." I would I would want to know where they came from. If they came from an oak or a, a, a red cherry, okay, that's, I'd try it. If they came from a, a pine tree, if they came from a, a fir tree, if they came from a hemlock, I wouldn't do it. If they came from a dead tree and he, didn't, he or she who collected it didn't know where they came from, would you eat it? All of us who eat mushrooms are going to make mistakes. I've made mistakes. Everybody who collects mushrooms is going to make a mistake. Right? It's it's no it's no embarrassment to make a mistake. Just fess up, and then we'll be, and report it to poison control, and that's how we get to know what's good and what's not. There are no good animal models. Okay, some of you are going to have questions about that. We'll deal with it later. I had I, I asked Lauren to put this slide in because we are now seeing this mushroom fruit in the s spring as well as the summer and fall. I included this mushroom in the winter course, but it was a, a bleached out mushroom, it was white. This is Hapalopolis nigilans or Hapalopolis rutilans. There's uh, two different species, but we, they're probably the same mushroom. They may be the same mushroom. Both of them, either or both of them, contain, are deadly, and they contain uh, uh, some, an ingredient called polyporic acid, uh, and it's a lot in there, 20 to 40 percent dry weight. So if you uh, collect this mushroom thinking it's an edible, which people have done, or you collect it thinking it's a medicinal and you want to make some tea out of it, you're going to get you're going to go to the hospital and you may not come out. And this is a deadly mushroom. So it looks nice and tender. <laughs> it looks good. <laughs> but just beware. Okay, just beware. Now, there are a lot of other fungi we're going to see in the spring. Uh, the Basidiomycetes uh, jelly fungus, uh, um, th these, these are still 
and the, the, the spores are formed on the clubs. Clubs are very difficult to see in here and they have special kind of clubs, but that being the case, the, the during when it's when it's dry, this mushroom dries up and just sticks uh, to the like a skin on the, on the bark. And then when rain comes, it just swells up. It's amazing how few hyphae are in there, but you get this gelatinous uh, uh, material. Now, some some chefs use this in jellies or things like that. You know, they use it in. They, you can't cook it well; it'll it'll disintegrate. But they'll use it. It just as a is a ingredient in a salad or or put it on the end of a, of a dish right at the end um, just for its look i don't think it has any taste to it so that's a witch's butter tremella mesenterica and here this is tremella foliaceae and this is exilia glandulosa now this one in particular is often th thought of as the chinese wood ear auricularia auricula judea uh, Chinese tree air or Jews tree air. Uh, this is, um, it looks, it looks similar to this, but it is an ascomycete. These are basidiomycetes. And you tell the difference between, between the different basidiomycetes by looking at the spores. And I don't know if, how well you can see it on your screen, but these are some spores. You see they're slightly, they're sausage shaped, pardon me, and slightly curved. Okay. Yeah. So, uh, so that, those are jelly mushrooms. Now we move on to some uh, guild mushrooms. Uh, these are still basidiomycetes, and they're in a larger, uh, smaller group called agaric guild mushrooms. And when you look at guild mushrooms, there are things that, that you're going to want to look at in detail. Uh, you want to look at the shape of the cap, for example. You know, this cap here is a, is a sessile kind of cap. Uh, and the, the gills here are, are going to be slightly decurrent. So you want to know, is, is are the, the, the cap here, what's the cap shape? Is it shaped like a shelf here or like a bell or uh, like I have a little umbo or a little uh, pimple in the middle? Or is it bell-shaped? So that's important. And then you also look at the gills, how they're attached. Are they attached on the side, as this one is? Are they free? This one is not. Are they adnate? Meet, meeting the stem at a square place? Are they notched? Are they decurrent? These will be decurrent here. And then you want to look at the spore color. Is it clear? Is it white? Pinkish, tan, brown, purplish, black? And you want to look at the habitat. So all of these are important macroscopic features which we use in field identification. So you'll want to be, be start to get very familiar with how to describe these mushrooms in these terms, because as you look them up, that's how they're going to be uh, described. Okay, so you all know what this mushroom is, don't you? This says previous. Oh, Lauren, I think we need the new slides. We do. I'm uh, going to start the next presentation. There you go. Okay, thank you. All right, there are too many slides to fit in uh, a certain file. That's why we're doing this. So you know what this mushroom is. This is the oyster mushroom, and it's called oyster mushroom Pleurotus ostriatus because it has a wonderful fish-like smell. Okay? Now I'm going to tell you why it has that nice smell and flavor. And I'm going to commit a, a fallacy here. It's called, the fallacy is called uh, a pathetic fallacy. <laughs> okay? Uh, it doesn't, it is a use, very useful term in linguistics and philosophy of science and in cognitive uh, science, but it doesn't mean what you think it means. Pathetic fallacy is a analogy, a story you tell, which is not true, but it helps the person emotionally understand what's going on. Helps the person understand what's going on because you're using not denotative characteristics, you know, things that are found in a dictionary, but connotative characteristics, you know, things you feel about, you know. So the reason this mushroom, we're going to commit a pathetic fallacy here and tell you why this mushroom has a an oyster-like taste. As it's growing, it sends out its tentacles and it makes a little noose. And with its little hand, it grabs nematodes as they crawl through the wood. And then because it's a fungus, it digests the nematode in its grasp and then brings inside the body the enriched nitrogen that it got from the nematode. 
Now, I don't think that mushroom knows what it's doing, you know, but I just described it that way. And we often do that. So that's how the mushroom, though, comes to have a, a more nitrogen rich diet and it has a nice enriched taste to it. So this is an oyster mushroom and they are wonderful, wonderful mushrooms to eat. So that was uh, 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 Ostriatus, Pleurotus Ostriatus. This had been called Pleurotus sapidus. It has a, a different coloration and it has different spores, it has lilac spores. Ostriatus had white spores. Well, now, if you take the spores from this mushroom and the spores from the last mushroom, and you put them together on a Petri plate, they mate. So then they know each other. They're the same mushroom. And so we now say that this mushroom is the same as Ostriatus. It's just a different color. Okay, So that would be a sister species we talked about earlier. Uh, I think I used this slide also during the winter presentation. Uh, this mushroom I have found growing every single month of the year at this latitude in the Hudson Valley. So uh, in the Catskill. So, so you'll find this all spring, summer, fall, winter. Here's another mushroom. It's, this is called the winter mushroom. It's Flamulina volutipes, often called the velvet-footed Calibia. This has attached gills. Okay, it's a white spore print. There's no ring around the stalk. It has a butterscotch-type uh, cap, and this slightly viscid and, and, and glutinous. Uh, so that's the velvet-footed Calibia. It maybe makes a, a pound uh, clusters on uh, elm trees. And here's a, a group of students in the culinary. We're out around this time of year, maybe a week or two later, and they find it on this elm tree. And there's a re reason why it grows on the elm tree, because the elm tree has been infected with Dutch elm disease, a fungus, which causes the, the vascular uh, system to strangulate itself with large sugar molecules this mushroom comes, this mushroom here, comes and lives on that rich sugar mole, uh, molecules. And so they live right in there. They just grow right in there. And so they pop the, the, the bark right off. Uh, you can see them growing right here. Now, some of you have are chefs and some of you have collected mushrooms uh, and bought mushrooms. And this will probably look familiar to you. This is genetically the same mushroom, but uh, the anoki, anokitake, the anoki mushroom is grown on um, a different substrate, often uh, oak, oak, oak straw, and it, it fruits in, in that way. So, and, and this is in a little, little jar down here. That's why it's fruiting like this. But these are, they look quite different. Uh, they, they, there's not much taste to these guys, you know, or, or to the flamulina, but there they are. But don't make this mistake. Flamulina was growing on sound wood. The tree was standing upright. It had only died uh, last year. This mushroom is growing on wood, which is dead for 10 or maybe 20 years. The wood is lying on the ground. It's spongy. It's, you can squeeze water out of it. It's, uh, it's pulpy. Okay? Uh, many different species of mushroom have gone at this log and they've taken out what they needed. And what's left behind, this mushroom comes and now can digest it. So these mushrooms exist in, in a sequence, just like they do uh, trees or any plants exist in a sequence. So this is Gallerina autumnalis, uh, is one of the, the names for it. Uh, the new name is uh, blah, 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 blah. Marginata. Uh, we now call this Marginata. So Gallerina autumnalis and three or four others are now called uh, Gallerina marginata or marginata. But this is generally autumnalis and it's generally found in the autumn. But this, I found this every month of the year in this area too. Now, this mushroom contains amatoxins, same things in amanita. And so even experienced mushroom collectors, I know experienced mushroom collectors have collected this thinking it was an edible mushroom and they ate it. So just be very careful about what you do. You know, unless you're 100% certain, just throw it out. You know, what, what do you, you know, just, just what, a, a, maybe a dollar, a, a 25 cents worth of mushrooms, just throw them away. I found this mushroom today. This is Pluteus cervinus, and it is called edible, but it's really inferior. It's really inferior. Uh, you can see that it sort of has a tan cap, a uh, little bit like a fawn or a deer, and it's called the deer mushroom, okay? And you see it has free gills here, free gills here. 
has pink spore print. It tastes terrible. And the reason it tastes terrible, it's mostly gills. Look at that. This is the uh, hymenium. So it's producing spores like crazy. So there's very little flesh on that. So when you eat it, it tastes moldy. Technically, it's edible. It's in all textbooks. It's edible. You can eat it. Yeah, they just, yeah. There's the free gills. They don't touch the stem. It looks like this one, a bit like this one. Here's the pink spore print. These gills touch the stem. Well, if it's pink spore print and the free, it's in the Pluteus genus. If it's pink spore print and they touch the, they're attached, it's it's in what used to be called entheloma. Now there's maybe a dozen different genera that, that, that are in that group there. But attached pink gills are generally poisonous. Call them all entheloma and you're okay. So you see the attached. You can actually see here if you if you see enlargement's good enough. The layer, the gills, is they're laid on top of this. Here's another one of that category: big, broad gills. This is Tricholoma platyphyllum, platyphyllum, a wide gills. Gary Galinkoff calls it the platterful mushroom. Plays on the name again. Very little flesh. Uh, some people eat this mushroom. Made some people sick. Other people eat it fine. I ate it once. Uh, with butter and garlic, and it tasted like cardboard with butter and garlic. You know, it tasted good. But <laughs> there you go. Uh, well, we know that platyphylla does not grow in, in genetically does not appear in North America, so you had to get different names for it. And it turns out there are about a half different, half dozen different species, which now go under the name Megacalibia rodmani or other Megacalibias variable form and edibility and it's probably why some people got sick from eating what they thought was platyphylla and other people ate it and they were okay. This is coprinus, uh, um, micaceous is the common name and when you look at the mushroom up close it has a little mica flex on it. It's a member of the coprinus group of mushrooms which, which all do, they have gills that just are inky. They're called inky caps but there are many different inky caps. Okay. So you want to get to know each one of them. This is now called Coprinellus. They've, they've not only are they, are they making new species here, but they're making new genera. This is Coprinellus. Uh, but if you call it Coprinus micaceus, people will know what you're talking about. Uh, it's in the micaceous radiatus complex. Complex is a group of mushrooms which are very difficult to tell apart. There are about 25 species in the, 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 uh, the textbooks on, on the, that are called, uh, they're part of this complex. Uh, for example, here, this looks very, rather different from this one, but these were taken just from the back of this cluster. They grow on, uh, the spores are black, they grow on stumps in the base of trees and whatnot. Uh, and for most people, they are edible, and uh, most people eat them and do fine with them. This is one, as soon as I point it out to you, some people are going to run out to the local horse farms. I know that. This is Paniolus campanulatus, uh, or now it's called uh, Paniolus papilionaceus, papilionaceus, rolls off the tongue, doesn't it? Uh, and it has attached gray gills, uh, black spores, and it is uh, hallucinogenic, weakly hallucinogenic, but it's nevertheless hallucinogenic. And this is uh, when I had horses. These are for my horses. Uh, neither I nor my chickens showed any <laughs> effect from eating these mushrooms. But some people, uh, you know, they apparently have psilocybe in it. I don't know. So this one here is also uh, an, another paniolus. This is uh, now called paniolina uh, phanisicii. Phanisicii has remained the same. So it's either paniolus or pan, paniolina phanisicii, the haymaker's mushroom or the lawnmower's mushroom. It has what's called a hygrophonous cap as it dries out, it changes color. Uh, it, it, and I'll, I'll show you in a, in a moment. I'll show you right now. The spores uh, the, the, uh, mature at different times on the gills, so the gills are mottled. So this has been called edible, uh, poisonous, hallucinogenic, deadly. See if I got all of them. Variously described as edible, hallucinogenic, and deadly. Yes. Right. So I don't know. It's a little brown mushroom. I should say something about little brown mushrooms. Some little brown mushrooms take a month. <laughs> I don't know. It takes weeks. Sometimes it takes, it'll take a week to identify a little brown mushroom, even to genus. And then what do you do after that? You know, 
And are you going to spend all that time? A mosquito, son of a gun. You're going to spend all that time to do that and then uh, and then eat it? I don't think so. You should know this much, get to know this mushroom, however. This is Agaricus rodmani eye. It's actually is rodmani eye. Uh, and it is choice. It's an Agaricus. Sometimes it's called Agaricus bitorquus. Has free pink gills, which turn brown. Spores are chocolate brown. It's dense. You put it in water and it sinks. It likes to grow in hard packed soil, like in an old parking lot. And look how thick the flesh is on this one. Isn't that wonderful? Really thick flesh. And it's, it's, it, it's, it's, it has a good tooth to it. It smells great. It tastes great. This is a choice mushroom. One of the things about, um, I can see why it's called by, by Torquist, two of these, uh, um, The, uh, the uh, thing about agaricus is that if you scrape them and they turn red, and you see a little reddening right here, then, then they're generally edible. If it turns yellow, they're generally toxic. <coughs> Pardon me. <coughs> and you can accentuate that by using uh, some Drano, hyd uh, hydrogen, uh, what's it? potassium hydroxide or sodium hydroxide. Very weak. You just put a drop in a in a you know a quarter cup of uh, of water and that that'll be it. that'll work for you. <coughs> There's been a recent uh, uh, talk by Rick Kerrigan <coughs> uh, about Agaricus. Uh, you can Google that online. You find he's he's the expert on that. So this is Stropheria rugoso annulata, the wine cap. Again, it's a choice mushroom and. Uh, you find it growing all along the roads now, where they where they where they um, um, don't use poison on the trees anymore. They chop them down, cut them down, and chop them up to get rid of them. So there's wood chip piles all over the place. You find them. It's called uh, the wine cap because it has burgundy co uh, cap color. The cap will fade to white. The sun and rain will do that. Nice thick flesh. Uh, pretty good gills here. Uh, the ring around the stem is ragged. So rugoso annulata. This is called the annulus, and this is rugged, rugoso, like a like a wagon wheel. Okay, so that's one of the important details that will tell this mushroom from anything from other ones. Um, the cap is burgundy and it fades to white. At the base of it, it's going to have white rhizomorphs, white little roots that go through the the wood chip mulch. It's going to have lilac gills, and the the ring itself. When you look at the top of the ring, it's going to have all these lines which came from the gills. I mean, the mushroom has so many distinctive characteristics. You will not. I nothing else looks like this. You'll be able to identify it quite easily. So that's Stropheria rugoso annulata. That's the spore print, and here's how to make a spore print. You take a piece of the cap. And you put it on a on a plain on a, a, a enamel plate or a piece of foil. Uh, moisten with a drop of water. Put a cap on the on the top of uh, cover with a bowl, and wait a few hours. And then it, it, either on the paper or the the bowl or the uh, the aluminum foil, you'll see the spore print. This spore print was taken in 1984, May when is that? 30th, 1984. First time I I know it to be in this area. You know, this was at the um, Cary Arboretum at the time. It's called Cary Arboretum. And I found it there. No one knew what it was. And we were able to identify it. And that's uh, we think it came into the Northeast on wood chips that came from somewhere else, maybe California. That's certainly how the hallucinogenic mushrooms in New York City, all over New York City, all over New York City and mulch are are hallucinogenic mushrooms that came from from uh, wood chips from uh, California. So Stropheria is really the easiest mushroom uh, to grow there is. No no sterile technique or anything. Just grab a handful of it from uh, where you find a pile of it and insert it into a fresh bed of hardwood chips, and there you go. Uh, if you go to leslieland.com or just Google my name and Stropheria, you'll find a number of articles, but you find out how, how to do this and you'll use dog food to actually help you with that. You'll find all that there if you want. So here they are growing in my garden there. Uh, they come up just, just you know, week after week. 
and they're nice big big mushrooms you know and i don't have that basket with me here i'd show it's in the car i'd show you the basket for size it's three times the size of my head so this is a grass of jura it's inedible it's growing in wood chips and uh it's the only thing that looks like it. You'll be able to tell that apart quite easily. You should know the Amanita uh, verosa bisporigera group here. Uh, these are the destroying angels. Uh, they'll come out um, in June. Tall, stately mushroom grows from a bulb underground, has a ring around the stem. <clears throat> it may or may not have warts on the cap, depending upon how the cup, which eventually encases this egg, which... Uh, uh, how it breaks up. If it stays together, there'll be a cup here, and we call them a death cup. A lot of people call them a death cap, but it's really the death cup. That's what gives it away. If it breaks, if this, if this, um, this membrane here breaks apart, you can have warts on the cap. Okay, it's going to have, there's the bulb below, and you can see the cup right here. Uh, the gills are going to be white. They're going to be free or finely attached. They're going to have a white spore print. Uh, and in most uh, amanitas uh, have a ring around it. So uh, never eat an amanita. Your life will be shorter, but not much sweeter. And I get that from the nun whose name is Swallow. She publishes poetry and Aryan things. Now the morels. Isn't it neat? This I think it's so neat that this guy's this guy sort of carries around his own field guide with him. He knows what he's looking for. So, He's going to go eat. Some people say, you know, if something's eating a mushroom, you know it's good to eat. Well, I don't know. <laughs> if you eat turtle food, maybe. Okay. Uh, the false morel first. The, there's a, there are a group of mushrooms called gyromitra, and they, they, you sh they should be considered toxic. Uh, uh, the, the toxin is uh, gyromitrin, named after this genus. Uh, it, uh, it is in Gyromitra species, Helvella species, Sarcospera, Sarcospera species, and Pazizia species. Okay, so it spreads throughout a, a number of, of, uh, of related uh, ascomycetes. Now, the, the Gyromitrin uh, will uh, break down into monomethylhydrazine, which boils at about 190 degrees Fahrenheit. Now water boils at 212. So if you're if you're cooking this mushroom up and you're sitting there and you're breathing in the fumes, you can die from that. It can it can kill the person who breathes the fumes, and yet the person who eats the mushrooms says the mushroom is fine. In fact, we know that many, I don't know if it's true, still true, but at one point, many of the morels that people were buying canned morels that were brought in from Europe were gyromitra. You can tell because they're totally different spores. So, but apparently there they've been cooked and the poisons had all boiled off. This causes, uh, uh, next to amanita, this causes more deaths in Europe than any other mushroom. Uh, so you should be very careful about them here in North America. Uh, the, the first to be destroyed are the red blood cells and kidneys, and it's also carcinogenic. So they're often called lord shells or elephant ears or brain fungus, but the, we, we tech, tend to call the ones around here gyromitra fastigiata complex or uh, carolina complex or brunia complex, gyromitras, okay? Once the soil reaches about 50, they and morels will both fruit. And toxicity varies from collection to collection, uh, and they're often collected from the table. And sometimes you can, if you eat this for a couple of days in a row, it doesn't doesn't hurt. Oh, Lauren, we don't have any more slides. Oh. Yes, we do. Are you ready? And we have about 20 more minutes, just uh, so you I'm, know. I'm preaking at my clock over there. I see that, yeah. All right, there you go. There you go. So when you cut them open, you see that they're chambered inside. You have these flat plates, pitted stem, you know, uh, not quite like a morel, but close enough so that people call them morels, and when they're they have a texture like somewhat like morels, and they can, they're, they're canned, been canned that way. Uh, I just, I, I don't want to spend much time on this, but a, a lot of people eat these, and they, they want to argue with me, and they say they're good to eat. I'll just point to this last thing. Uh, when, when people get poisoned by mushrooms, I work with poison control, and we work 
we co we co I'm with NAMA and we coordinate with Poison Control. So all those cases get 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 reported. And Michael Bug, who cor correlates all these, when he goes to talk to the people who have been poisoned by by gyromitra, they say, "Oh, that mushroom couldn't possibly cause cause me. Uh, it's, it's not toxic at all. I've been eating it all along." But that's the one that caused them to get sick. Just know that, okay? Michael Quo has a similar sort of thing. Wikipedia has a certain certain sort of thing. Uh, uh, there's some people get away with a lot of things. They get away with, you know, stealing cars. They get away with using crack and fentanyl, you know. But there's gyromitra, false morale. Now the morels. This may surprise you, but morels are poison unless they are cooked. Invariably, if you try to eat them raw, you're going to get sick. And if you try to eat them with a light stir fry, you're going to get sick. And I have called on many a case where that was that was the problem. So just be very careful. They have to be well cooked. So you want to put them in a in a pan, cover it, let them give up their own juices, and then you want to work with those juices and that and the mushroom in that case like that. Um, now, some of these morels are probably up now. This is the first one that comes up, Verpaconica. It's, it's up before the, uh, the, 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 the blossoms are on the apple trees, before leaves are out. Uh, it's probably up. I, I generally don't go out and look for them. I don't eat them. They're interesting to find. Uh, if you eat them, they give you the staggers. <clears throat> there's, there's another Verpa out west and midwest that looks like this that will also give you the staggers if you eat it. And that's called... Uh, Verpa bohemica. It, it, it's very different uh, mi microscopically. But we do find these around here. This is Morcella semilibra, semilibera. Uh, and this is edible. There it is. It has a new name. It's called Morcella uh, punctipes. And the reason for that is because semilibera doesn't gr grow in, in North America. So punctipes is here in the Northeast. Out in the West, it's called Populophila. Goes under poplar trees, I guess. It's often called the half free morel. This is the edible part up here. You can eat this. It's just tough and somewhat untasty. There's a, there's one of them uh, again, and here's a basket full of them. Again, about three heads. <laughs> if you look at how size that basket. Uh, yeah, I find these in 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 uh, benches alongside a stream. You know, there's a, a, a floodplain there. Rich soils. Butternut is often a good indicator tree for those. And then, and then you'll come to black morels. Black morels are, are coming up right now. Uh, three weeks ago, they were up in New York City, and then they stopped. Uh, uh, on two or three days ago, I looked online, and the morel maps, you can, you can look for morel maps online. They'll tell you where the morels are. And uh, they, they're one appointed in the, in the Hudson Valley, one in the Catskills, and one up in the northern Catskills, and one in Connecticut. That was as of the weekend, I think. They were all dated 430, I think, 429. Or 430. They're coming up right now. And you see, they, they can get quite black. They have a hollow inside. Okay, that's a morel. Black morels, the ridges are darker than the pits. You can see here that the pits are lighter. This is a dark morel. There are a number of names for those, uh, but we generally call them black morels now. Uh, and now morels uh, show what we call polymorphism. This is from a cluster of them, and they look quite different. Some of them, this is quite, this is really different than the others. You know, some of them have the sinus, some of them don't, uh, but they're quite different. And we call that polymorphism. They have a very complex biology, as we pointed out. So, so in in the Northeast, lots of names come and go. Uh, the black ones, the ridges are darker than pits. The blondes, the ridges are lighter than the pits. Lots of different names: Escalenta, Escalentoides, Almeria, Americana, Crassipes. Uh, the half free ones are called semi libera or punctipes. And then you have tulip morels, real small things, and the thimble cap we just looked at, Verpa conica. So these are, the, these are the, the two big ones here the half free morels, and then these two right here. But they show a great deal of genetic variation. They look different. And the reason is that they're genetically different. This is uh, from a GTR, for maybe a, uh, a decade ago, maybe. Uh, 10 years ago, uh, Dr. Carol Carter, no two morels ever analyzed were found to be genetically identical, even if they were growing from the same cluster. So this, I think by going over some of that technical material earlier, I hope it helps us understand why that's the case. 
you know, if, if I would have told you that without showing you the genetic, that all that technical material, you know, some of you people would have said, this guy doesn't know what he's talking about. He's crazy. Uh, that may be true, <laughs> but, but nevertheless, this is what Dr. Carter, who is, who is a geneticist, says about them. So morel season starts early. It should be starting right now. Notice that black morel right there. Notice the down jacket this woman is wearing. Uh, notice the state of the vegetation around. I have found black morels uh, as early as the end of March, sometimes in April, uh, but generally starting right now, May 1st, it's when they come out. When the forsythia leaves, uh, petals are on the ground, that's when you're going, the morels are going to come out. That's the first ones come out. Uh, so uh, you can, you, you, I think, you know, we may find some on, on uh, Friday. We'll see. Uh, some good seasonal indicators are apple bloom. So when you see the apple trees in bloom, there's the black morels. And you can see, again, the hollow interior. Uh, it, when the lilacs in bloom, my, the lilac I've seen is tight in bud. Over here, my apple blossoms are tight in bud as well. They're just showing pink. But uh, I think, you know, we're going to get maybe 70 degrees tomorrow. So we'll see. We have blondes and we have brunettes. Uh, Escalenta and Angusticeps, those old names. We now, now they're generally called blondes and brunettes. Uh, one of the reasons why I'm saying here you can, you should, you can, it's okay to use uh, common names is that the geneticists say that common names are, uh, how to put this, scientific names are probably no more accurate than common names when it comes to morels. The, the only difference is they've been published in, in, in a journal somewhere. But uh, they, they, they vary quite, quite often, quite, quite easily. So these are blonde morels. You can see that the, the uh, ridges are lighter than the pits. Uh, my knife is three inches long. So you can see that big they are there. Well, three inches long, it's closed. Six inches when it's open. So here we got here, it's May 12th on the blonde morels. Okay. They usually appear here by mid-month in May. Uh, the young Esculentas are gray. As they mature, the spores mature and they, they become orange. And if you're going to dry these in your oven or, or a dryer, they're going to throw spores all over the place. They really throw a lot of sticky spores all over the place. Uh, the chefs like them as they get more, as the spores are there. They develop more tastes. And almost everybody says the, the blonde morels are much tastier than the black morels. And the, among the worst morels are the ones that grow on fire out west and worse, that they just have the least taste. Uh, those are the, the they're, they're, they're related to the ones that the Chinese are now growing in wood chips. Uh, and they, they are also those, those, those related to the ones out west. And I'm told by chefs that they also have a not as good a taste. But the ones growing under elm trees or apple trees have the best taste. And I'm told that's because they're mycorrhizal with those trees. And not only do they get the juices from the trees, but there are yeasts in there, which give them a, a special flavor component as well. Uh, seasonal indicator for blondes when the asparagus is up. My asparagus is up now. <laughs> no blondes, though. Not even blacks. But, but generally, when the asparagus is up, you're going to find those as well. Uh, if the trout and fiddleheads, if trout are rising to a dry fly and the fiddleheads are up, then the, the, uh, the, the morels are up as well. I won't talk about that photograph. There I am. There are two uh, chefs in the culinary. These are dead elm trees here, and you can see they're scattered throughout this. This is perfect morel-looking area. Perfect. We, we probably gathered a peck of them right here. You look for the cracked bark on an infected elm tree, and these are the students in the culinary and chefs in the culinary going out and collected mor collecting morels. In that same area, just a week later when the, uh, the vegetation is up, uh, here we have an ash tree. We found black morels under this ash tree uh, for five or six or maybe seven years in a row. And then one year we came, and these are chefs and students in the culinary. And then one day we came by and uh, it had all been raked. With, with an iron rake. And, and from that point on, we no, no mushrooms are found there. Uh, this is garlic mustard. It's a good indicator for uh, morels. 
This is an apple tree. It doesn't look like an apple tree, but it's an old apple tree. Those are good indicators for morels as well. Perfect. Be careful of apple trees, though, because if if the, if uh, lead arsenate was used uh, between 18, say, 60 to 1940, uh, the lead and arsenic are still going to be in the soil, even if the trees are dead. And now what you find there are elm trees. So you, and and they will get on the in the morels. Uh, those of you interested in morels, go and listen to the talk on morels. I know I talk fast trying to get through it, but I think I think you'll be able to to get some stuff out of it. And there certainly are some readings you should have a look at. Ladies' bed straw is also seen as a good indicator for morels. There are 27 morels in this image. Limestone, sweet soil, limestone, railroad beds, burn sites. Um, the place where that woman was killed the other day on the uh, Amtrak, those tracks have, often have morels growing right up and down the tracks. Uh, I know people that get arrested on the tracks, not, be, not because it's dangerous to be there, but they get, get arrested for it's, it's illegal to be there, but there are morels there. Late in the season, you get these huge morels. That's called a crassipes. Uh, and this is the normal size, and here's the large one. They're essentially, all they are is esculenta, just gotten bigger. That's all. And also, you're running in June, in, all the way through June, under tulip trees, you'll find these little, they used to be called deliciosa, now they're called tulipfra or diminutiva or virginiana. Okay, those grow there. So go out early and often. You know, sometimes you look at a place, there's nothing there. Come a week later, and there they are, you know. Uh, May means morels, but May also means turkey hunting season in, in New York. So the turkey hunters ha should be out of the woods by noon. So don't go crawling around on your hands and knees uh, in, in the early dawn uh, if, if you value, <laughs> I don't know how to finish it, finish it any way you want. Uh, one of the things, if a group of people, this is what happens. You go out and you find one morel and look at that. If you go out with a group of people, you know, you're going to have to share all your morels. But anyway, if you go out by yourself, isn't that something? Yeah, there this little fawn is. Right? I'm looking for morels and all. Of it. And this is not the first. I think I found four fawn in exactly the same way. Just walk, looking around my eyes down on the ground. And suddenly in front of me is a little fawn. So may luck be with you. And thank you very much. And I think we can take whatever kind of questions uh, you have right now. Uh, yeah, thanks, Bill. Um, that, this was really great. Lots of great photos in there and um, lots of great information, too. So we can open it up for any questions. We have just a few minutes. You are welcome to use the chat. Um, if you'd rather just ask the question di directly, you can use that little hand symbol for the speak. Um, and I can uh, I can direct you there. Um, and you may have noticed that there are some files um, that Bill has uh, some handouts that Bill has um, given to you. Um, I will also send out those files, all those handouts when I send out the link to the recording, just in case anyone had to leave early or if you are watching this um, watching this afterwards, um, I will send out that information as well. I'll include that. So. So we can open up for any questions. I know um, we will. Uh, we do have that walk that is on um, that is on Friday afternoon, and uh, we should have some good weather, as you were saying, Bill. So I think uh, I think we're kind of getting yeah. getting some good uh, some good mushroom weather right now. That's wet okay. and it's starting to get warm. So so hopefully some more things will be popping up. It's always it's always spring is always. Yeah, I think I think we're gonna yeah things are gonna start happening soon. Yeah, yeah, it'll be really great. And um, you will be joined on the walk by our community um, science coordinator, Penny Adler Colvin. And she is also uh, very knowledgeable about mushrooms. Um, and of course, she's our community science coordinator as well. So she can give you more information about participating in some um, projects that are happening through the conservation science department. Ah, okay, so here's a question. What is the best way to identify elm trees for locating morels? Any tips? Oh, yeah, sure. Uh, well, well, you can easily find a photograph of the elm bark. It's gray and it has diamond-shaped uh, ridges on it. Uh, but uh, you're going to have to, and, and uh, there's, uh, you're going to have to look at a number of different elm trees. Uh, but you you can look online for that. The ones to look for are going to have bark that's cracking. Okay, 
and 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 when the bark is cracking, that means that flammulina is there. That means that the tree is dying, dead. Flammulina is there. It tells you this is a dead tree, a recently dead tree, because you don't want a tree that's three years old dead. No more morels there. Morels will fruit under a, a, a dead elm tree the first year in profusion. You might get a peck or a bushel under an elm tree. Elm trees often at the bottom have long um, legs that go out, and the, and the morels will be right along those, those roots. Uh, the second year when the bark is just hanging there and someone's on the, on the bottom, on the ground, you're going to find um, hmm, maybe a dozen morels. The third year, you might find one or two. After that, none. So you want to find an elm tree. And then once you find one, you have to look maybe at 100 elm trees to find one which is, has morels. Once you find it, come back to that tree. Even if it's not producing elms, other elms in the area will now have been infected by the beetles or by root grafts underground. They will now have Dutch elm disease. And so you can go from tree to tree to tree. And a lot of elms have died out, but but there's a lot of elms in the woods around here. They 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 come back, and there's spe different species of elm and uh, elm and, and also ash. Ash you can tell by uh, it when it's dying, and has that flaky yellow bark, a bark pretty much the color of that slide that's still on the screen. There's yellowish kind of bark there, so that's the way you can tell. Yeah, and um, ash sometimes their bark does present with that diamond groove shape that you were talking about on mm -hmm. elms. But um, ash trees, uh, one significant difference between ash and elms is the opposite branching. So um, ash trees will have opposite branching, meaning that the on the twig, the um, leaves and the buds and all of the twigs will be coming off directly across from each other, whereas most will have a zigzag pattern alternating. Um, so they will have alternate branching. So there'll be a bud on one side and then you move up a little bit. And it's over here and over here. So they won't be directly across from each other. So mm -hmm. ashes have opposite branching um, and elms do not. So if you see something with diamond shape, grayish bark um, and it has opposite branching, that's an ash and not an elm. So thank you. That's, mm -hmm. that's very helpful. Yeah. My pleasure. <laughs> I might not know as many mushrooms, but I do know some trees, so. <laughs> this is next. What's next here? I didn't know there was any next here. Oh, that's it. It was just, that's uh, it was just the end. <laughs> <Okay>. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> yep, just the end. I don't know why there's an extra slide at the end there. Um, huh. Yeah, everyone is really just thanking you for the great information and the great presentation. Oh, thanks. Um, another question, though, please. Yeah, I don't, I don't. Everyone's really just saying thanks. So if there is another question, we have just a few more minutes. Um, okay. I'll give you a chance to to pop one in there. But um, but yeah, raise your hand. Wiggle your hand if you have a question. <laughs> <laughs> a good recipe for morels. How about that? Ah, uh, uh, sure. This is this comes from uh, a, a guy named Chef Rosenthal, who was uh, one of the chief hunters at the culinary years ago. Uh, you want to split them open to make sure there's no little no no critters living in them because the, the critters live in these 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 mushrooms. Split them open and then lie them in the pan um, uh, with the with the, the honeycomb side up uh, and have a little butter in the bottom of the pan just so and then then under low heat cover them and let them let their let their juices come out and then uh, somewhere along the line you want to put in some shallots and perhaps some garlic. But two other ingredients, which are quite unusual, a few caraway seeds and a few, just a few. Like if you have maybe a half for every morel, maybe you have four morels, put in two caraway seeds. Uh, you don't want it to taste like rye bread, but it, the caraway does bring out an earthy kind of character to, um, to the, uh, the morels. And the other thing to add is a little bit of, of cut up bell, green bell pepper which does the same thing. Uh, so then you cook you cook that for a while and make sure the, the morels are well cooked. Uh, along the line, you want to add just a little bit of uh, tamari, not much, maybe a little hint of sugar, not much, uh, salt and pepper, obviously, uh, and then uh, cream, obviously cream. And then you finish with just some sherry, um, not much, uh, you know, couple tablespoons, uh, maybe up to a quarter. 
cup. Of, uh, your, let's get, depends on how big your dish is. Uh, and that is Morel's Rosenthal. And you put that over pasta and it is, my mouth is, my mouth is watering. Just talking about it. None of you hear that, but my mouth is just full of saliva. Just be, that is a really exceptional dish. <laughs> well, it sounds great. And I, you know, what? I think that is a delightful way to end this presentation. <laughs> Maybe now everyone is uh, going to have a late dinner, perhaps uh, thinking about that. So, okay. so I want to thank you again, Bill, for another fantastic presentation. Um, and again, this will be, um, this has been recorded and it will be available in our archives. I will send the link out to everyone who is registered. Um, and I, there are also other fantastic presentations that Bill have, has done for us in our mushroom series um, and they are all archived. Um, so you can check those out on our website. Um, and hopefully um, some of you will be able to join Bill on Friday for his yes. walk. Yes, yeah. and when you do, you can bring your questions there. Yes. They will come to you. The questions will come to you, I'm sure. I'm okay. sure they will. Yes. Thanks a lot, guys. Yeah. <laughs> Thank you so much, Bill. We'll be in touch.